Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Thamburri. This episode of Italics honors the craft of Italian shoe repair. We'll hear from author and producer Suzanne Corso. I was 17 years old, and she comes in with this Smith Corona typewriter and says, Bubbola, write yourself out of this story. <laughs> and walk the walk at New York Fashion Week with Italian international photographers Armando and Vincenzo Grillo. Tra le città della moda avete una preferita? Non possiamo dire che New York. <laughs> In this, the digital age, in which quotidian needs are rapidly obtained the fast and cheap way, traditional methods that keep us in touch with other humans and provide a quality of life are otherwise lost in mass production or inaccessible to most. At James Custom Shoe Repair in New York's Upper East Side, the art of Italian shoe repair is one of these prized, slow, personal, old school ways. When Nicola Pecchia emigrated from Italy to East Harlem in 1966, it was only two years before he took over the shop from the original James, who ran the business since 1948. Let's visit Mr. Pecchia and his son Gennaro at their shop and hear from them. James Custom Shoe Repair was an actual James who started the business probably about 20 years before my dad took over in 1968. My dad actually started as an apprentice from Italy. Well, in Italy, it's like you go to school, kindergarten. We was in the, every shop, I got a 12, 15 kids learn the shoe repair. They were so cheap, you never touch the leather. You just to watch. And you learn with the watch only. I go to Switzerland. There was a big factory in Switzerland. 20,000 pairs a day, shoes. Nobody watch me. That's Italian style. Then I met my wife over there, with Cecilia. So I don't know, like, like a rabbit. So I said, what the hell is this? Wait, 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 wait. Then my wife will come in America. And she come back to pick me up. I'm in port. And basically came to New York and worked for Mr. James. And Mr. James loved my dad's work so much. He was an older man. He wanted the actual shop to still exist. And so he basically gave the shop to my dad. No, I pay. <laughs> no give. Oh, I didn't know that. He sell it to me. When I started, I worked 7 in the morning to 11 in the night. I was working for myself for 10 years straight. He's never been back to Italy since he's emigrated here to start to work because of the business, of the family, of the responsibilities. Particularly in the United States, it's certainly a dying art. Unfortunately, younger people don't want to learn about it or they don't have the opportunity to learn about it. This is hard work, this is long work, this is long hours. So, you know, even in the United States, probably you have about 7,000 shoe repairs in the United States now, down from about 20,000 uh, 10 or 15 years ago. We're in a time where everything's disposable, everything's cheapified. Even people uh, buy shoes, wear them for a little while, they don't fix them anymore, they just throw them out. Most things are plastic, whatever, so thank goodness that people still have taste and still care about quality and artisanal things. That's what keeps us going in a shop like ours. The doctor would say one day, take the shoes. I say, wait, doctor, go wash my hand to touch the shoes, there was the nice shoes. I say, Nick, what do you do? What do you mean? I have to wash the hand first. It's the doctor, a, yeah. what do you do? Before the customer coming. You need to wash your hand. I'm a doctor. The shoe doctor. <laughs> when you say shoe repair, shoe making, it's really recrafting at the end. So we're recrafting shoes. So we're taking raw materials, replacing what is broken or what is not usable anymore. This is a shoe that came in and it was in disrepair. So what happened is the leather was all ruined underneath because even for companies like this, high luxury companies, they're cutting back on what they do, so they use a really thin layer of leather here. What we do is we change the heel, and we put a protective rubber, which is great on city streets. So really, that's what they call it, it's a soul saver. The shoes is more for dressing. But the people that like it so much, they use it every day. The beauty of being on the Upper East Side for over 45 years is that it's really family-oriented. It's still an original New York City neighborhood. 
So, I mean, we're taking care of so many children at schools here, everybody from ballet students to people who run the world. The original James Custom Shoe Repair was on 87th and Park Avenue. And basically, it was down a block from Gimbel's. And so, we did all the work for Gimbel's. Right around the corner, the Kennedys lived. So, my dad took care of all the shoes for the Kennedys as well. So, the Kennedy family were very, very good to us. And in turn, we made some good friends, and they were like family. I was working the wind. My, 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 my appellants was right in the wind. Every morning, the people pass by. I say, good morning. And they come inside just to, to fresh air. So you make my day, you make my day. So everybody bring the shoes inside. My dad treats everyone the same way, with respect and with uh, dignity. We followed him 25 years at least. Every Christmas Eve and every New Year's Eve, this man puts out a spread. My wife always says, I know, I know, we can't go out until you go to, the, uh, to see your friend. And so every year it's a tradition. We all show up, unless we're out of town. Uh, and it's uh, every uh, Christmas Eve and every New Year's Eve. People were so thankful for the work that you fixed for antiques. We did a lot of work for plays, for movies. And so my dad kept a nice uh, little scrapbook here. So A. Testoni was the top premier shoemakers in the world. And they started to bring us all their business from the New York store and international stores too. And we were one of the only shoe repairs that was actually authorized to do A. Testoni repairs. This was a show that was in New York City and they needed shoes made for some of the cast members for a period piece. And this was just a lot of fun and my dad came up with ideas and worked with the directors and the costume people. Eventually, you know, People leave, they still send us uh, things back to be repaired. Mm -hmm. 60 minutes, which is really cool because it's so New York. We were in the New York Times. This whole article is about my dad. New York Magazine came to us and said, if we gave you a pair of shoes before, we want to see what the after effect is after you're done with your repair shops. And then, you know, we have always customers sending us pictures of their children. Oh, I feel good. Depreciate. I got a couple of problems. I got a stroke. Oh. I got an operation. Uh, my life it was not too, not too health anymore. But I keep a uh, uh, run. He had a stroke about eight years ago. Uh, I was doing my regular job and coming back at nighttime while the guys were working to manage to make it happen. My mother said, close everything. I said, we're not closing because that's his lifestyle, his livelihood. That's his heart. That's really what makes it my dad's heart pump is his business. So I think he felt better and got better because knowing that the business continued on. So that's what I did for my dad and with pride. But also, people would call up and say, um, is your father there? No. They, they waited a year before they brought the shoes in until he came. He said, you're right, you're his son, but you can't do what your father can. So I said, oh, what am I going to say to that? I said, I agree. Bye. <laughs> the importance of shoe repair or this craftsman type work is that you keep tradition going on for an important trade. Hopefully you'll be able to hand down his trade to other people and that's why I work with my dad and try to learn as much as I can. It's definitely something that's needed. People always have to fix shoes, you know. Many times even when we're going to close or whatever, he's not worried about his schedule or his life. Who's going to take care of people's shoes? That's the key thing. The shoes are my baby. You may know her from the Today Show's Weekend Movie Ticket, Access Hollywood, or from her best-selling first novel, Brooklyn Story. Writer-producer Suzanne Corso joins us in the studio to talk about her personal and creative journey, continued through her latest, Sweet Life, and her final installment of this literary trilogy coming out in May 2015. Suzanne, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. You address some deeply personal issues in your novels. Yes. Brooklyn Story is actually my first novel. Mm -hmm. And this was published with Simon & Schuster back in 2010. It's part of the trilogy. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, Bensonhurst in the late 70s, early 80s. And I had the misfortune of dating someone in organized crime for nine to 10 years. 
and my life kind of unfolded in a very abusive relationship, physically abusive, emotionally abusive, and it was very difficult to get out of until he went to jail. And that was my escape, although I thought it was my escape, and then he was sending people to hurt people who I was dating. So it was kind of a strange relationship amongst having a very tough, powerful Jewish grandmother and my mother who was also Jewish but who rebelled against my father who was Italian, a Sicilian, who lived in Sicily and she wound up rebelling against him and raising me Catholic. So that's, I had a blessed mother on my neck since I was five years old. So that was my only way. That's it in a nutshell, Brooklyn story, <laughs> amongst a bunch of other murders and crimes and everything else. I read a quote in Hamptons Magazine uh -huh. where you said that your grandmother bought you a typewriter and she said, here, yes. type your way out of this. I was 17 years old, and she comes in with this Smith Corona typewriter. I think she bought, I don't know if it was hers, or she bought this typewriter, and she always knew that I was writing poems as a child, and she gives me this typewriter and says, Bubbala, write yourself out of this story. <laughs> and she puts it down, and I'm like, okay, what am I going to do with this? And I stared at it for close to a year, and then I just put the paper in and just typed Brooklyn Story. And that was when I was 17 years old. And I was dating this man from organized crime. And my mother was into drugs and promiscuous and crazy. And my grandmother was the matriarch of the family. And there was no male influences in the house at that time. And I just started writing Brooklyn Story. I didn't even know what I was doing. I was a 17-year-old girl. But I knew enough to write about my own stuff. And it was almost like this journal. And then 400 pages later, I had this book. Tell a little bit about your grandmother. She was. Jewish, my grandfather was Jewish, I think it was Polish and Russian from that side. And I really didn't know a lot about them because I, when I, as I got older, my grandfather was no longer, I think he passed away before I was born. And um, she only wanted to live in a Jewish way. She wanted me to marry a Jewish man, but my mother wanted me to be with an Italian man. It was all, it was all crazy. But Christmas time, we'd have the menorah, we'd have the Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting. You know, because usually, just, like in the Jewish culture, it's the Jewish right. The when you're born of a yeah. Jewish mother, you're a Jew. I just wasn't. I uh, I was raised that way. It's interesting, and I never went to um, any of the. I didn't know anything about being Jewish. I still don't know to this day. <laughs> you know, so I, I go to church religiously once a week. So this is what I know. I have a tremendous amount of faith, and you know, the Blessed Mother and. Jesus and all that good stuff. And so the writing yourself out of the story, right. was, did the writing actually help you reflect and get out of it? Or Without a doubt. I think that writing saved me because I dated this man who was not a good guy. And growing up in Bensonhurst back in the day, that's all that was there these young boys, and they were mafia boys, and they were, you know, the sons of these fathers who, it, it was the bloodline, it was what you were supposed to do. They all would treat the women in a way that you wouldn't want to be treated, and they wouldn't treat their mothers that way. It just made no sense to me. Yeah, it that's really kind of like, you know, the, like the patriarchal thing. It's like it's yeah. the mother is revered, right? Right. Kind right. of like the holy mother. Right. And then the the partner, well, not even partner, right? Because right. she's not treated as a partner, it's almost like property. Well it's like they contradict yeah. Yeah. themselves all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm good to my mother but I'm not good to you. Right. But I'm good to my girlfriend, but I'm not good to the wife. Yeah. It's all crazy. What do you say to mafia deniers. Let me just stop by saying, I mean, just because we're Italians, either from the other side, from here, Italian Americans, it doesn't mean that we have anything to do with the mafia. I mean, I think that is the biggest stereotype. And then it really was crazy when The Sopranos came out. And, you know, I kind of enjoyed the show, but there was a lot of stuff there, too. I mean, it's just part of life. It's like gangs are part of life. Mafia's part of life. Do I think it still exists? Maybe. I don't think it's as powerful as it used to be. I mean, you know, we have shows on TV now. We talk about it all the time. It's one of those things, but yet there's this fascination with it. From way back in the James Cagney days, it's just one of those things that, especially women, not all women, but some of them are attracted to these men in organized crime. There's something about them. I don't know what it is. I mean, I was one of those women. Not anymore, but... What was it that attracted you? Was it the power thing and like I being protected? I think he was a powerful well, guy, very protective. The image, we would go places and everyone would respect him in a way that I couldn't understand, mm -hmm. you know, compared to the regular guy on the street. Right. But then after a while, you realize you're in a bad relationship. You're with a man who's controlling and abusive, and it's okay for a man to protect you, but not 
on that level. Yeah. Well, we also want a society where we don't need to be protected. No, right? we're yeah. women, right. especially now, 2014. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, we don't want that. We want to be in love and be happy, and it should be an equal relationship. Right. And it's hard. I think as women, we're faced with that today. Not only Italian um, American women, all women. Mm -hmm. You've talked about this abusive relationship, mm -hmm. and he he even stalked you. Yeah. After the relationship yeah. was over, and threatened subsequent partners and boyfriends. Yes. How do Italian Americans deal with domestic violence? It's not only Italian Americans. I think all women dealing with domestic violence. I mean, for me, it was my faith. If I didn't have my faith, I don't know what would have happened. And then I had that lucky break when he went to jail but even when he was incarcerated he would send people to harm any man I was with until I wound up meeting my husband and then that put an end to it you know I married someone on Wall Street and it just he backed off he was just one of those things where he just realized that he was never going to be with me and he backed off men who abuse women are weak let's call that what it is mm -hmm. they're weak and there's nothing tough about them and it's so sad that we're so afraid of them. Right. But at the end of the day, they're weak men. How do you get out of it? For me, it was faith. I mean, now we have organizations. I mean, it's hard to tell a woman, you have to leave. I mean, financially, you have to be able to get out of a relationship. It's, it's very difficult. Right. And then if this man is stalking, you know, it happens if often. If a man is stalking, it's, it's so difficult. You can't get you need away. to get an order of protection. I mean, mm -hmm. there are cases when you have to go underground. There's nothing good about domestic violence, yes. physical or emotional. I mean, there, you can be in a relationship where it's just emotional and this man is belittling you all the time. There's no reason to be there. Right, or neglect. Or, or neglect, yeah. but then women get so, you know, look, the world is divided in half. There's secure women and there's insecure women. And it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. I'm very blessed that I got out of it. And I wrote about it, so it was cathartic for me. It's always good to hear other people's stories to see how they coped right. and how they got out of it. And it's true because I hope that my books help other women. Because I got out and I'm here. Mm -hmm. So if I survived, hopefully you can too. Brooklyn's story, which we've been talking about, yes. is about what you've put behind you. Yes. And then your second book, yes. Sweet Life, the Sweet Life, covers the life that you led from that point yes. till now. When I got over the Brooklyn Bridge, that metaphor in my life, like mm -hmm. the cables, my strength. I mean, I've always loved Brooklyn. It was the people in Brooklyn that I had to get away from. It was very stifling for me. There was a ton of obstacles. So once I got over the bridge and I was in Manhattan and I was writing and I met a wonderful man walking down the street, my husband, he was a big Wall Street man and that was wonderful and we had a daughter. That's a lot about what the sweet life is about, the rise and fall. The main message in the second book is the money doesn't define you because what happened to us in 2008 was my husband wound up losing all of the money and I'm talking a great amount of money so long you know the homes go the jewels go everything goes and you realize what's important in life mm -hmm. I think I've always known what's important in life I mean the money is just an addition it's just financial freedom mm -hmm. I don't think money should define anybody that's just where I'm at with mm -hmm. it and I think it defined my husband in a lot of ways and then when he lost it all it was just a big downfall so it was just the ups and downs of being a Wall Street wife when the market was just at its peak did he come from money or was it was not it really a, yeah. I think he came from middle-class family and definitely more money than me I mean I was poor I was welfare food stamps you know mm -hmm. cheese blocks so and then I went from that to the mafia world to close to a hundred million dollars and the whole time I was basically like this it's all good to have things but there's more in life than just that and people should never know your worth mm -hmm. your worth is what you are what I'm giving to you mm -hmm. it's not about the dollar signs it never is and uh, for a lot of people, especially today, I notice everything is about money. Mm -hmm. We live in a society where everything is about money. Right, and, and being it's famous. Sad. Being and being famous. Warhol predicted and it. And everybody, <laughs> everybody wants to be famous. For what, I don't know. I'd rather be healthy, have money. I'm not gonna lie, financial freedom's great. Have some money and just be in love and be happy. What else are we here for? Right. And do things for others. Yeah. All my friends say to me, who's getting divorced, who's this, who's that? Oh, you know, I wanna meet a man, but you know, he has to. He has to have money. So I say, okay, so if you're with a man who has a ton of money and let's say he smacks you around, that's okay because he has money. I've heard what is people, that about? I've heard people justify right? this too. Well, it's okay because he, he affords her the lifestyle right. she wants. And I'm right. like, the lifestyle she wants mm -hmm. is not to be hit. Or, Everyone's yeah. forgetting all the love. And as women today, we actually can work and do things to make money. And we have to show our daughters that. I have a daughter who's 15, and she sees me work. She sees things, and that's very important. I want her to make her own money. Right. And you marry for love.
Yeah. What's the point? Exactly. Coming off the sweet life. Right. Um, you have the final installment of final the trilogy. Final installment. Right now the working title is Hello Hollywood because this is how the books have gone. Mafia, Wall Street, and Hollywood, I think, are just three of the biggest entities. And I refuse to write about politics and religion. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm not having five books. I'll do that. So, yeah, you do that. But you did mention that your faith was one of the things yes. that brought you out of the abusive relationships. Yes. How much do you cover that in the in I cover the a lot of it in both books. I try not to, you know, people don't like sometimes when you speak about religion. But my beliefs are I am Catholic. Um, I strongly believe what you put out, you get back. I light my Blessed Mother candle every morning. It's just what I do. But I also have a Buddha in my home. You know, I'm, I'm very, I love that. And those are my beliefs, really. It's funny because my first two, I lived them and I wrote about them, changed things, you know, made them fiction books. My third one, I'm actually writing what I really want in my life, what I'm vibrating in. Mm -hmm. So I made myself start my own company, which I kind of already have a production company. So I have my own company. I take my daughter. I leave, um, my husband's gone, we kill him off at the beginning. It's just something that happens. <laughs> what did he think about this? Well, he didn't care, it's all right. He says, of course, you kill me off. We kill him off, I move to uh, Los Angeles, start my own company, and I wind up making Brooklyn Story into a movie, and I wind up meeting someone from 30 years ago who has the same background as myself. Mm -hmm the mob, the Wall Street, and now he's a big Hollywood financier. And it's one of these things that ties all the stories together. And it's nice, at the end of the day, Samantha winds up in love, which is what she really wants. It's the whole arc of the story, so. I think that's what we all really want. Oh, without a doubt. to be loved. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Fashion, along with style, one of Italy's distinct characteristics, one of the world's biggest industries, affecting all of us, whether we like it or not. With Fashion Week taking over New York, two brothers from Calabria show us how it's done. Every time I step outside, I do The clothes I wear, got Sell. The cars I drive, got Sell. The places I go, got Sell. The people I'm with got I know that you like my style. I know you wanna hate my style. Siamo qui con Armando e Vincenzo Grillo, nessuna parentela purtroppo. Grazie ragazzi di essere con noi. Grazie a te. Voi avete cominciato nello studio fotografico di vostro padre. Sì. Che cosa vi ha ispirato a fotografare la moda? Diciamo che è stata una passione maturata nel tempo. Io guardavo un po' di riviste sempre e mi, mi è venuta questa passione. L'ho maturata piano piano perché ho iniziato con papà, e, però ero, ero sempre attratto da queste campagne pubblicitarie, da queste fotografie così. Poi piano piano diciamo che diciamo che un sogno si è realizzato. Avendo anch'io la passione per la fotografia mi incuriosiva tanto il mondo della moda mm -hmm. quindi ho iniziato a frequentare dal 2006 questo mondo e alla fine ho continuato così, è difficile uscirne ora. E come si fa la strada da Vibo Valencia a Milano? Non voglio dire la Salerno Reggio fino alla 1. Con un po' di coraggio diciamo che io Uh, avevo finito i miei tre anni all'università, allora ho preferito, avevo detto a papà che volevo andare a specializzarmi nella fotografia. Mm. Lui d'accordissimo e quindi ho iniziato solo, sono andato via, sono andato a Milano, ho scelto un, uh, un corso di fotografia, ho iniziato a studiare la fotografia lì. Dura all'inizio perché ero solo, un ragazzino, però ce l'ho fatta, piano piano. E subito dopo, dopo un, po', un po' di anni l'ho raggiunto perché lui mi parlava tanto bene di, sta, di questo mondo, no? E quindi mi ha mi, mi incuriosito tanto e sono andato a provarlo anch'io. Quale sensazione vi dà venire qui a New York due volte all'anno? Vi sentite che vi state emergendo nella cultura newyorkese oppure Fashion Week è un mondo tutto suo? Intanto è un piacere tornare qui eh, due volte all'anno perché è una città bellissima. Per quanto riguarda la cultura si incontrano sì i newyorkesi, 
però diciamo che il mondo della fashion è un mondo tutto suo quindi perché ci sono abbiamo cambiano un po le location ma le persone i fotografi e i, i direttori dei giornali le stylist le giornaliste sono sempre quelle lì quindi diciamo che è un mondo tutto suo nei vostri giri internazionale Londra, Parigi, New York, avete incontrato delle persone della diaspora italiana? Beh, a New York penso tanti, mm. tipo ieri un, picc- cioè, ieri un uh, tassista siciliano che parlava solo dialetto. E gli hai risposto in dialetto calabrese? <ride> sì, sì, per forza. <ride> o milanese? No, 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 anzi è stato molto simpatico. Ed era emozionato che er- eravate italiani? Sì, sì, infatti <ride> mi spiegava che c'è stato due settimane fa, era in, uh, in Sicilia, era in vacanza ed era... Era un po' dispiaciuto del suo ritorno in, a New York. Come li trovi a paragonare con gli italiani rimasti in Italia? Loro parlano sempre dell'Italia. <ride> eh, così, simpaticissimi, e pa- ti parlano, continuano sempre a parlare dei loro posti, eh, che quando tornano, che gli manca sempre. L'Italia diciamo che manca a tutti dopo un po'. È l'Italia. <ride> Armando in questa settimana dove sei presente tu? in quasi tutte le sfilate più importanti perché avendo delle riviste come El diciamo che copro tutte le sfilate più importanti dai vari Alexander Wang eh, Ralph Lauren Mark Jacobs eh, eccetera, ne posso dire tantissimi altri, quelli che mi sono venuti in mente sono questi, però ci sono su tutte e Vincenzo, tu questa settimana dove sarai presente? Anch'io sono presente davanti a tutte le sfilate importanti perché il mio lavoro è lo street style. E che cos'è street style? Street style è fotografi tutti gli invitati, tutta la gente del mondo del fashion, il loro stile, è il, il trend del, dell'anno. Trovi dalle giornaliste, dalle fashion blogger, le modelle. Oltre alle sfilate e street style vi occupate di altro? Sì, abbiamo dei clienti dove facciamo le campagne pubblicitarie, i cataloghi, sia per web che sia per, uh, su carta. Abbiamo diciamo, anche uno studio dove scattiamo tantissimo e quindi ci occupiamo di questo, sempre nel mondo della moda. Tra le città della moda avete una preferita? Non possiamo dire che New York. <ride> Le città preferite sono Milano, Londra, New York e Parigi, le mie preferite. Poi diciamo che come vivibilità una che vivrei è Londra. Parigi, per la moda, veri eventi, lo show, tutto quello che circonda quella settimana a a Parigi, sono molto affascinato di Parigi. Se dovete scegliere un posto in tutto il mondo, anche se non ha niente a che fare con la moda, se magari potresti, potresti avere un aereo privato oppure far diventare quel posto il centro della moda, dove vorresti vivere? Calabria. La Calabria. Anch'io. <ride> Thank you for joining us for this episode of Italics. Tune in to our next episode of Italics airing October 29th, and our sixth season of Italian Heritage and Culture Month specials, airing October 9th, 16th, 23rd, and 30th. Watch previous editions of Italics on cuny.tv slash show slash italics, and additional webisodes on our Italics YouTube channel, Italics TV. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. For fall events taking place at the John D. Calandra Italian American Institute, visit our website, qc.edu slash calandra. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.